All right, so um, we are looking at um, core English, and our focus for today is the poem Makola. Makola. And so we'll treat that poem today. I know this is called English, so I wouldn't go, of course, so deep like elective, um, 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 how do you call it, um, literature. But I, I just hope you bear with me. If you don't understand something, just raise up your hand and ask. So we'll look at, um, by the end of this lesson, students should, one, understand this poem. You should be able to understand this poem, Makola. And you should also be able to answer, I mean, to correctly answer questions on this poem. Now, uh, you are not writing an essay on this poem like the elective student. You are just going to, they are just going to give you some questions and you just um, um, tick, tick the right answer. So you should be able to understand the poem very well so that whatever question that has been thrown at you, you'll be able to answer the question. Um, so that is basically the focus for this or our learning objective for this point. Now, so uh, before I even display the point, let me go to um, the commentary. I'll read, we'll read something on the commentary uh, first before we start analyzing the poem um, line by line. So the poem, Makola, written by... Hello. I'm sure you're all with me. Please, if you have a problem, just raise up your hand. Okay, so what you do is this, if you are with me, just nod your head. Don't don't talk, just nod your head. Let me know that you are with me. Is that okay? Good, good, good. Okay. Um, I see somebody raising up the hand. William, William, you raised up your hand. William Shepard, you raised up your hand. Yes, unmute yourself and, and yes. Shepard, uh, the line is breaking. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll, we'll try and work on that as soon as possible. Uh, another person with the hand raised. Akiti Pell. Okay, you've taken off. You want to win? Akiti Pell. Akiti Pell, I can hear you. Okay, so let's quickly go to um, the commentary. Now, so we are saying that the poem Makola, uh, I believe we all know when we mention Makola, where Makola can be located. Uh, Makola is one of the biggest markets uh, in Accra. When you go to Accra, you say you are going to Makola, everybody virtually knows where Makola is and we know what goes on there. Now, so it says the poem in Makola is not so much about the market as a place, as the people who work in the market. So Enin uses, Enin is the writer of the, uh, of the poem, who we could also refer to as the poet. Enin is, is the poet. So Enin uses the market as a magnet to draw the people to a location where it becomes possible to observe them and exploit their emotions and their socioeconomic condition. Now, we, we realize that when we read through the poem, we, we see four categories of people, four categories of people. Uh, we see the woman who um, had a, a little problem with the, the husband and, you know, at the market. Then we see the, the cat pusher, which we popularly known as the track pusher, the track pusher. Then we see the little girl um, who, uh, let me see, more or less like a, a teenage mother 
who has her baby at her back. Then finally we see the, the little children who play, you know, aimlessly at the market. So the point paint three, uh, sorry, four categories of people and their socioeconomic conditions or their standards of living. So Enim just used the word makola, more or less like makola, which is a market, but uses the word to just give us a clear picture. For instance, when you go to the market, what do you see? You see different classes of people, different people who are selling tomatoes, people who are selling um, 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 garden egg, people who are selling uh, um, fish, people, they are selling all sorts of things and they are there with their different, different problems. So Enim uses market to capture the whole idea of all the people or the four classes of people that she has you know written about in this poem now this interpretation is confirmed by the fact that there is very little reference to the buying and selling that go on in the market um, of the size of makola we see that apart from the the young girl the teenage mother who is selling um, um, pure water or selling ice water, whatever it is. The others do not sell anything. The truck pusher does not sell anything. The, uh, the, 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 the woman who we see in the, um, you know, in the first part of the poem is not selling anything. Um, the little children who are running about are not selling anything. Now, we, we know that market is a place for selling and buying, but we look at all these four categories of people that the poet captures in her poem, then we realize that only one out of the four is actually selling. So we are saying that ending, the, the ending using Makola as a marketplace is not necessarily as a place where the people are buying and selling, but it's just to, you know, um, um, you know show the classes of people that we have and what they are going through. Now, so the only reference to a commodity is to sachet water, which is introduced more as an emblem of poverty and lack of social, socioeconomic power rather than a hot item of high economic value. High economic value. Now, in comparison, there is much more said about the people in the poem. So like I said earlier, there is much more said about the people in the poem than the, 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 the selling and the buying that we know when it comes to markets. If you look at the four classes of people, there is much more uh, about that has been said about the people. There's much more that has been said about the, the socioeconomic condition or the... the the social status of the people or their current um, um, state of living than what do we actually know in the market setting. Now, it says it includes men like the domineering husband that we, we see about the woman. Then we see the driver's mate and the cat pusher. The cat pusher, like I said earlier, also known as the truck pusher. Now, each of these people is aggressive in their own way, but it's not above vulnerability and exploitation, just like the women in the poem. Now, this group is made up of an anonymous housewife who has a very little say or power in the home. Now, so that talks about the domineering husband. The woman is you know, when we say anonymous, someone who is not known, the woman um, is sitting aloof, you know, lost in her thoughts and thinking about all the things that are going on and how her husband is, is not, you know, or the husband does not really understand her plight, her condition. Or, in other words, the domineering, you know, attitude of her husband. Now, so let me go back to that again. This group is made up of an anonymous housewife who has a very little say or power in the home. 
any woman or a woman who doesn't have any power in the home or more or less like have little say in the home uh, it only means that there is a domineering husband who doesn't give her the opportunity to express herself the opportunity to come out out of her shell and that is the first person we see the woman the anonymous woman then we look we see that there's also a teenage mother and her running nose baby as well as the children who are running uncontrollably through the crowd we also see the teenage mother the young mother with the little baby with runny nose you know at her back now that also depicts something or it's a picture of something it, it, it you know it clearly you know tells us the the social status or the social um, standard of the woman clearly it tells us how poor the woman is now all of these people belong to the lowest level of life where the basic necessities of life such as what to eat or wear cannot be taken for granted we see we see the the teenage mother and we see that according to the poem she has an old tattered 80 year cloth you know that she has used to to hold her baby at the back and then again we see that the teddy bear that the baby is holding has one eye off the baby you know at the back as you know as having a runny nose clearly all these things are indications or they connote the fact that the woman is actually poor and struggling and so she has to carry um, um, a bowl of um, sachet water selling you see selling of sachet water many times depict um, the fact that the person is poor many times many times it may not necessarily be all times but many times because people who sell sachet water you ask yourself how much do they really make out of the selling of sachet water i mean if one um sachet water is um just one not a bag one is 20 pesos or so and you are selling like that how much can you possibly make out of that you see and so it is usually seen seen as those who sell sachet water are from the lowest part you know of of the divide or the lowest end of life they are not people who are rich they are the poor and in society now let's go on now all of these people belong to the lowest level of life where the basic necessities of life now, you know there are basic necessities of life like food what to wear shelter there are basic necessities of life and anyone who does not have these basic necessities of life it's, it's, it's usually seen as somebody who is poor. You don't have food to eat. You don't have what to wear. Where to even sleep becomes a problem. Then it means that you do not have the basic necessities of life and you are seen as somebody who is poor. And you see that this um, a teenage mother, this teenage girl, uh, you know, clearly, when we begin to read the poem, we'll look at her and we'll see, um, uh, uh, you know, what goes on here in her life ironically the time-tested remedy of putting the baby to breast suggested by an older and more experienced woman does not work because of the poverty that has affected the teenage mother's ability to produce breast milk you see because the the the, the teenage mother was advised by a more matured by a, a, you know an elderly woman uh, to breastfeed the baby but what do we what do we see we realize that because the mother herself doesn't have much to eat she doesn't have much to feed on her body is not able to produce the required uh, um, breast milk for the baby she doesn't have much to eat she is poor what to eat is a problem and that is why she has to sell pure water or the sachet water and so because of that she is not the body her body and to even begin with the body is not even much developed the body is not even much developed we look at that in a poem the tiny hands and tiny body the body is not even much developed she doesn't have much to and so because of that 
the body is not able to produce the required breast milk for the baby to eat. And so, you know, the baby cries and she doesn't know what to give to the baby. Now, so in fact, Makola is a brief sketch of the big city in which it is situated. So we realize that the Makola has just been used as, um, as, as a vehicle or as a tool to convey, you know, the, the standards of the lives of the people or the standards of the lives of the people. So, um, like I was saying, Makola, as um, the term used, is just um, more or less like a tool or a vehicle to convey, you know, the various classes of people we find in the society, especially when you go to um, a typical market. So basically, that is, that is the commentary. That is the commentary on the poem. Now we'll begin to look at um, stanza by stanza uh, analysis of the poem. Now, in the first, from the beginning, it says, head bent, rags all around the upside down pan, picking her nose, shuffling her feet, oblivious to the bustle and the cause of the driver's meat. Head bent. You see, um, the use of the word head bent, uh, just to, you know, it's a pose of a deep thought and defeat. You, your head is bent and you are obviously carried away by your thought, carried away by the things that are happening around you, carried away by, you know, the perhaps the situations of life, the conditions of life, the things you are facing. So head is bent. I will get to know whose head is bent. Head bent, rags all around. Rags, rags. Now, rags here, you know, will symbolize poverty. Because many times you see rags, 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 rags. It depicts an idea that where you are, you know, it's, it's really not um, a, a rich home. Rags all around. The upside down pan. Now, you go to a home and they are cooking utensils. They are cooking pot and blah, blah, blah. Has been turned upside down. Obviously, it, de it depicts the idea that uh, maybe there is nothing to cook or they are done cooking or many times there is nothing to cook and that is why it looks like, you know, uh, you know the pan and everything has been turned upside down. Then it's just picking her nose shuffling her feet, oblivious to the bustle and the cause of the, dr of the driver's mate. The woman who is there, you know, picking her nose, shuffling her feet around, you know, and to be oblivious means to be there, you know, uh, more or less lost Hello. completely about what is going on. Hello, boss. Oblivious. It means not noticing what is going on around. A sign that she is preoccupied with her own thought. Perhaps the quarrel with her husband earlier in the day. So the woman is sitting down there, oblivious of the things that, that are going on around her, which means they're not noticing the things or not realizing the things that are going on around her. Then the poem goes on and says, this morning, she quarreled with the husband. So we get to have an idea about the reason why she was oblivious of the things that are, run, that are going on around her. And it could be the reason that because she quarreled with the husband that morning. And she was one, wondering, why wouldn't he understand that her work is very tedious and involving? The woman was wondering, why wouldn't my husband understand the fact that, hey, the work I am doing is very tedious and involving? Why must it all be on his terms, at his convenience? Why should it be that whatever I'm doing, whatever we have to do, 
you know, must be on the terms of my husband or on the agreement of my husband or on the, you know, uh, unless, of course, my husband agrees, unless, of course, my husband gives the go-ahead, unless, of course, my husband says this, says that, that is when we have to do something. So everything has to be on the terms of her husband at his convenience, whenever he feels like, not when the woman feels like, not when both of them sit together and discuss when they should do it, but on the terms of the husband, on the convenience of the husband. Now, clearly, you understand that what is happening here is that the, 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 in the home, the man dominates the home. The man is so domineering. It's so, you know, the head, so much the head that the woman has no say. Everything has to be on the terms of the man. Everything has to be on the on the convenience of the man. The man does not understand the fact that, hey, the woman's work is tedious and involving. So because of the argument, the, the quarrel she had with the husband, you realize that, you know, everything that morning, while she was sitting down, she was just shuffling her legs and she was oblivious up to the fact that, you know, all the things that are happening around her, she was oblivious to the bustle and the cause of the driver's mate. You, you know, when you go to the station, somebody's screaming. Um, I cry, I cry, I cry, I cry. Somebody's screaming, I flow, I flow. Somebody's screaming, whatever it is. They are saying all sorts of things. The mates are saying all sorts of things. And even we, in the face of all this noise, all this shouting and screaming and all sorts of things, the woman was sitting down there and she was completely lost in her thought because of what she is actually going through in the house. Now, then the poem goes on. It says, move out of the way. Move out, I say. Shout the cat pusher. Then we have a second class, another person here. That is another class of person in the society. The cat pusher, also known as the track pusher. Also screaming there, move out of the way. Move out, I say. You know, shout the cat pusher. So none cares about his agitation. You know, when you go to the market, those who are pushing the truck, they are screaming and shouting. And obviously, nobody cares about them because everybody is busy doing what he or she has come to the market to do. None cares about his agitation. Then the, 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 the poem describes the things that are going on around him. You see that the sweat runs down his face, tiny rivulet of disappointment and fear. And what happens? The sweat sneak down and glide effortlessly into his dirty T-shirt. His tongue peeps out and leaks the bead of sweat on his lip. So we see another class of person here. That is the truck pusher. And the poem says that, you know, because of the work he was doing, sweat, you know, began to pour on him. And what happened? The sweat is, you know, moving down like snake. Snake, it says the, the poem snake down. Sorry, the sweat. So the persona uses a literal device. That is a metaphor. Compares sweat to snake that the, the, the sweat snake down and glide effortlessly you know a snake glides the way the snake glides you know moves around glide effortlessly effortlessly that is the same way the sweat that are pouring on him you know are gliding effortlessly into his dirty t-shirt now if you look at the word dirty t-shirt it also paints a picture here that a cat pusher is also poor or from the poor side of life. His tongue peeps out. Now, under normal circumstances, if you are sweating, you should use a handkerchief and wipe your face. But because he doesn't have a handkerchief, he, he, you know, he uses his tongue to, to lick the sweat on his lip. Clearly, it paints a picture of, you know, a poverty reading person. Then it, it goes on. It goes on to the next. It says, that young girl, 
with the thin arms. Thin arms. Young girl gives us an idea that the girl may be a teenager with thin arms. Young girl with thin arms gives us a clear idea that the girl here it's, it's, it's depicting a teenager with thin arms balances a bowl of sachet water on her head. Selling sachet water. The running nose baby at her back is supported with a faded ATL cloth. So the young girl or the young girl with tiny arms is just not carrying a bowl of sashi water on her head, but we also realize that at her back is a baby that is that is having a runny nose, a runny nose baby at her back, and is supported by um, supported with a faded ATL cloth. Now, you see we have different types of cloth. We have the ATL. We have the 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 Hol Holland or what some refer to as Hollandis. We have the uh, GTP. GTP and so on and so forth. You see, GTP is expensive, or GTP is seen as you know for the rich, the Hollandis also for the rich. But ATL is more or less like something that can you know. So wooden, wooden, wooden. <laughs> okay, now we have wooden. We also have a. Uh, uh, there's there's one that they sell one year for ten cities now. Uh, one, I've forgotten the name. What is the name of this color? What is the name? What's the name? What's the name? Uh, okay, when the name comes, I'll, I'll 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 mention it. So ATL then ATL is seen as one color that is not really expensive. But then again, you realize that the ATL color you use here is a faded one. Clearly. It depicts poverty or it connotes poverty that they are from that poor background. And this young girl who is more or less like a teenager with thin arms, you know, uh, you know, uh, with a baby at her back. And this is, you know, a clear depiction of teenage pregnancy. Now, and this teenage pregnancy could also, we could also trace it down to a whole lot of factors. It could also be because of the, the kind of poverty that is why she got herself involved in that and got pregnant and blah, blah, blah. Even though we can't prove that by the point, but we can connote or denote some of these things or deduce some of these things from what we are reading in the poem. Now, he holds his hand, he holds in his hand a battered teddy with an eye missing. The teddy bed already is battered, could possibly mean dirty and looking also, whatever it is, you know. And the teddy bed has just one eye. It means that they can't afford a better teddy bed. That is why the boy is holding a teddy bed that is, that is battered with only one eye inside. And the poem goes on to say that the baby whimpers. She tries to soothe him by patting his leg. You know, sometimes when babies want to cry, they begin to do all sorts of things. They begin to, you know, agitate or behave in a way. And so the mother realizing that she did decided to pat the leg of the baby in order to soothe the baby or in order to, you know, calm the baby. He refuses to be soothed and gives a loud yell. The baby didn't pay attention to the mother, just started crying, give it a loud yell, yell. Now, then an old woman, or a woman who I believe is more experienced, who might have been, you know, a mother herself, you know, counsels the, the young lady, put him, sorry, put him to the breast. Put him to the breast means give him breast milk. And the mother replies, I can't, she says, I have no breast milk. Why doesn't she have a breast milk? Because, one, she doesn't have food to eat, and so the body cannot produce enough breast milk. It also means that the breast is not well developed because she's a teenager, she's a young girl. And so she doesn't have enough breast milk to give to the child. Then the poem shifts again to children you know, who run in and out of the stalls. 
followed by shout of the storekeepers. We have children who are running, you know, here and there, you know, without paying attention to what the storekeeper is saying. The storekeeper says stop and blah, 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 but they are not paying much attention. So it says heedlessly, they continue their game of catch me if you can, running recklessly through the overcrowded market, the orchards and school dropouts, you know, the orchards is poor and often mischievous city children. You know, they are poor and mischievous, you know, and some of them are school dropouts running here and there without, you know, paying much attention to what the storekeeper is saying. Now, it says running recklessly through the overcrowded markets, the orchards and school dropouts, leaders and teachers yet unborn. And some of these people, you know, are leaders and teachers yet unborn, of course. Bread on the cocktail of the street delicacies. Now, what does this mean? They, are, they, are, they have been trained, trained, you know, on the cocktail, bread, on the cocktail of the street delicacies. So the street or whatever they go through on the street, it's like the kind of, you know, food that they are being offered. The street is their home. It is their life. That is what they know. That is what they've been born and bred with. You know, they train them on, you know, on the street life. And you see, some of these people are supposed to be our leaders, our teachers and future leaders, you know, but that is where they get. That is the only option they have. They have no other option. So they are forced to just, you know, grow up on the street. And if just, obviously, if they grow up on the street, there's nothing better that we should expect out of them. Nothing better can come out of them. Then it says, Makola has it all, another face of the great city. So life has it all. Makola is just not a market, but life has it all. Life has the different, different categories, the different classes of people, different, different, the poor, very poor. And even among the poor, there are different, different, different groups, you know, among the, the poor, the, 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 the woman we see, earlier in the poem with a domineering husband as one class there's poverty there as well the other one that is a track pusher you know struggling hustling you know for 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 ends meet even the 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 how do you call it the driver's mate screaming and shouting akra, akra, plow, plow. they're also doing their own sort of things then the young teenage girl also with babies at her back you know um, you know, selling pure water or selling sachet water for her to be able to put some food on her table and for the table of, of her baby. Then this children also running here and there, children who are mischievous, you know, poor and mischievous, very funny, poor and mischievous city children running here and there who wouldn't want to listen to uh, the advice of the storekeeper. So basically, this is what the poem Makola is about. This is what the poem is about. I'll pause here. And then um, if you have a question, you raise up your hand. If there's something I say you don't understand, you raise up your hand. Let's go over that before um, we look at some of um, the literary devices um, that we can, we can get from this, this poem. So if you have any question so far on what I've said, you can just raise up your hand and then unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, any question, please. Is that to say that you all understand? All that I've said. Yes, any question? Angela, any question? William? Any question? Maybe there's a part of the poem you don't understand. Francisca? Sir. Yes. Uh, who turned this up? 
whose hand is whose hand is up? Whose hand is up? Who wants to ask a question? Are you all with me? Marceline, do you have any question? Okay, Sheena wants to ask. Yes, Sheena. Yes, unmute yourself and ask your question. Sir, I have a new question. Oh, okay. So, are we just saying that we all understand the point we can move on? Yes. Okay. All right. Now, so let me ask these questions. Now, you are going to go through the poem. The poem is displayed on your screen. Uh, we'll go through the poem. And if you have any literary device, okay. So go through the poem. Let's see if you can get some literary devices. If you have found one, raise up your hand and let's discuss it. Let's discuss it. Can you tell me why you think it is that literary device? Yes. Any literary device? Ali, we should know some of the yeah. simple. Yes. Yes, William. So please, uh, we can find metaphor. Okay. This right. metaphor in line 12. Line 12. Yeah. The sweat what? that runs down his face. Okay. Why, why, yes. okay, first and foremost, define what metaphor is. Define what metaphor is. And why do you think that line, we can find metaphor in that line? William, are you with me? Yes. William, are you with me? Hey. Hello, William. William. Okay, so William is saying that William Yes, William, your hand is raised. I can see it. So just uh, meet yourself and then and talk. We are listening. Sir, yes, I'm listening, William. Sir, please, metaphor. Okay, it's so, a figure so, of. Okay, yes, go on. Sir, metaphor is a figure of speech which is applied to an object to which is not literal, literally applicable. Mm. Can, can, can you repeat yourself? Uh, let me get that clear. So, it, so I'm saying that metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word is applied to an object or an action to which is not literally applicable. Okay, William, let's, let's do with this. Um, 
let me just make it very simple for you. Okay. Now, metaphor is... Okay, before I give what I want to give, uh, I want to find out if anybody has any other definition. If anybody has any other definition. About metaphor. About metaphor. Any other um, idea on, the, uh, idea on what metaphor is? On what metaphor is? Yes. Yes. Yes, Marceline. Yes, Marceline. Just unmute yourself and then. Just unmute yourself, yourself and then. Um, just unmute yourself. Oh, sir. Oh, sir. Um, William, please hold on. Uh, Marceline is on. Is, uh, William, is on please hold on. Second. Yes, Marceline, let's hear you. Marceline, I, I can barely hear you. Good. Uh, so, William, let's make it very simple. Okay, very simple for you. Metaphor. Please have another one. You have another definition. Yes. Okay. All right. So, let's hear that one. So we can also say that mm. metaphor equates two things, like not because they are actually the same, for the sake of comparison or. Okay. Or, same okay. for the sake of comparison. Okay. This this is clearer than the first one that you gave. So metaphor basically compares two things without the use of us and like. So the difference between metaphor and simile is that simile compares with the use of us and like. Metaphor compares, but does not use you know us and like. So they all have comparison, they compare, but metaphor compares without the use of us and like it compares something so if we look at the line that you are given what's the line you give again line 12 so please read that line okay a sweat that runs down his face mm -hmm. tiny revelate of disappointment and fear okay yeah, and say so please, right. the metaphor there is a sweat that runs down on his face. So, sweat is being compared to a snake that runs down and glides effortlessly into his dirty t shirt. Okay, I'm sure we all agree with that. If you don't agree with that, you can raise up your hand. So, what we are saying is that. Uh, the persona or the poet compares snake, uh, sorry, compares sweat to a snake that the sweat glides down effortlessly, like the snake, even though they, di they didn't bring the lichen as there, all right. But sweat is being compared to snake that goes down and glide effortlessly. I don't know whether that is clear. Is that clear? Yes. 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 <coughs> okay. Any other literary device? Any other literary device? Sir. Yes. Sir, onomatopoeia. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sir, please. Line two. Okay, line two, yes. So when they said shuffling her feet. Shuffling her feet. Okay. Yes. Shuffling her feet. Good. Produces the exact you know noise that we expect. Shuffling the feet. Yes. Shina, your hand is up. You know, say alliteration. Say again. Alliteration. Yes. What is alliteration and what can we find it? 
is the repetition of consonant sounds usually at the beginning of um sentence or something okay so which where can we find alliteration in the poem he hold in his hands line 22 okay Line 22. Yes, repeat the line. He holds hands. A battered teddy. He holds in his hands a battered teddy. Now you see, you should understand that alliteration is the repetition of, of what? Vowel sound, right? Is that right? Yes, sir. Not just the verb, but the sound. No, sir. Say, say. say again. Say, please. It's consonant sound. It's consonant, alliteration. rather. Alliteration. Now, but my, my, what I want you to understand is that we are, you know, when it comes to alliteration, we are looking at um, sound, the use of the same consonant you know, sound. So our focus is actually on the sound. So if you say he holds in his hand, holds, hand, in a battered teddy, he holds in his, in his hands a battered teddy. Do, you, do we all agree with that? Uh -huh. Listen. Paula. Say yes. Yes, same, same. Paula. Say. Yes, let's hear you. I, I think that if it should be correct, then she should just end at hands. So that it becomes he holds in his hands instead of adding a battered teddy. All right, that's okay. So he holds in his hands. He holds in his hands. We all agree with that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, are we here? Do we all agree with that? Yes, sir. All right. So that's another Detroit device. Any other? Sir. Yes. Uh, Francesca. Please unmute yourself and give us what you want to give us? Francisca? Yes, sir. Yes. Um, this eight. Say again. Line eight. Line eight. Okay. Line. What different yes, device is that? The, um, testification. The, um, the stretch runs down his face. Good. Yes. You know. <laughs> Now, even though, yes, we can, we can have metaphor there as well, but yes, we can also have personification there. The sweat runs down. That is giving human attribute of running to sweat. That is um, an inanimate object. So that is also correct. Sweat runs down, giving a human attribute like run to sweat. Please do we understand that too. Yes, sir. Do we understand that too? Yes, sir. Good. Any other literary device? Sir. Yes. Sir, please be the personification. Okay. Can we also say from line 16? Line 16. That tongue, yes. Tongue peeps out and leaks. Is that also personification? No, his tongue peeps out. Yes, it yes, is. Peeps out. It is. Because tongue, uh, you know, you see, we are looking at the action. The action there is peep out. And normally, there's human beings that peep out. Is that right? 
Yes, so sir. that is an attribute of a human being, giving a human attribute to an object that is not human. So the tongue peeps out. We can say it is classification. Tongue peeps okay, out. And not just out, oh, and it also leaks. Tongue peeps out and leaks. Yes. Yes. Please, do we agree with that? Yes, sir. Do we all agree with that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can hear only uh, William. William is the only one that is really active here. Please. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. 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 I haven't heard from you today. Golda, you are too quiet for me. Okay. All right. Any other literary device? Is it Yes. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yes. It's a rhetorical question. Rhetorical question, yes. Why wouldn't he understand that a work is very tedious and involved. Okay, so we know that a rhetorical question is a question that does not demand an answer. So the woman is, even though, yes, the question she's asking, uh, it's a valid question, but of course, it doesn't demand any answer. So, yes, we'll say yes, we we'll agree. It's a rhetorical question. It's a rhetorical question. Any other literary device? Uh, said dirty t-shirt. Dirty t-shirt. Yes. What uh, imagery. Imagery. Image. Image. Yes. Dirty t-shirt. Yes. Imagery. Mm. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, of course, um, imagery, you know, gives us a mental picture. Is that right? So mm. when you say dirty t-shirt, it gives us a clear idea the kind of shirt we are looking at or how dirty the shirt is dirty t-shirt well I'll, I'll take that i'll take that um i see a hand up paula paula Say. yes um it's actually a question i'm not too sure okay from um line one to line three can okay. that also be imagery you know, if you want to look at yeah. that, if you want to look at that, um, mm -hmm. we say that virtually the whole poem is imagery. Virtually. Okay. Because, you know, uh, if, if we're to be looking at elective liter literature, they could ask you to, um, you know, examine the use of imagery in the poem. And you can get a lot of instances because almost almost everything in the poem you know gives us a clear idea and imagery as you know uh, you know gives us a clear mental picture for instance head bent once you say head bent you close your eyes you know that when you say head bent you, you can picture something head bent rags all around uh, rags all around the upside down pan picking her nose shuffling her feet oblivious to the basil and you know you can easily you know pick a lot of lines in the poem, this poem, you know, that gives us clear imageries, almost everything, almost everything, imagery, almost everything. Not all, but almost. You understand? Okay, yes, please. Aha, uh -huh. look at the track pusher. You can easily, you know, picture the track pusher and his dirty t-shirt and sweat all over him and the sweat are gliding and moving all around on his body. You can easily picture that thing. Uh -huh. So, if you want to look at the first two, three lines, it is, yes. But as time that there are a lot more of, a lot more of, of them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question, please? Or any literal device? If you have any, just raise up your hand. Mm -hmm. Yes, Marceline. Marceline. 
Yes, ask your question. Or you want to give us a... Say again. Can macrolides be used like an allusion or something? Can you be like an allusion? Allusion, where? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, allusion. Making a reference to something. It could be historical or whatever it is, biblical. Well, so allusion, making a reference to the Makola market, eh? Makola. Wow. I see the literature students are taking us deep. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one, I'm I'm sure the the call maths people. I mean, the call people. It may be too much for them, but in as much as you are right, it may be too much for them. So, uh, all right, let's go on. Yes, Tiola. Say. Yes, please ask your question or say what you want to say. Um, say. Yes. Uh, alliteration. Alliteration. Mm, okay. Running recklessly. Running recklessly. Yes. Okay. Running recklessly. Yes. Do we agree with that? Yes, I agree with you. Running recklessly. Is there any objection to that? Any objection to that? Running recklessly. Okay. So we agree to that. Sheila, your hand is still up. Solution. Your hand is still up. So you can just lower your hand. Yeah. Okay. Michael. Say, yes. Allusion. Allusion, where? Um it's with a faded ATL cloth. Okay. Um, like it's a reference to the textiles in Ghana. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Uh the reason why I don't really want to go so much into that, um, I think this is, this is English. core English, core English. So uh, let's not go too much. <laughs> let's not go too much. Let's 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 keep to the simple ones for the benefit of um, core English. We okay. Okay. Yes. If, if we are looking at um, how do you call it? If we are looking at uh, elective literature, if we are looking at elective literature, then we can go deep, deep. But this is called um, how do you call it? Call English. So um, let's not go so much. If not, some people will get lost. Our colleagues will get lost. Is that okay, Tiola? Tiola, if we were to be in a literature class, I'm sure we can just we can go about that. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? You're a literature student, right? Yes. Okay. I understand. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Don't call. Ajua, I think you just joined in. You, I mean, you just joined the class. Do you have any question? Don't call you with me. Kumi, Monica, Say your hand is up. Kumi, Monica, your hand Say. is up. Yes. Say, please, I would like to ask from okay. the first line. Okay. He said, head bent and rags all around the upside down. Mm -hmm. Can't it be that the woman 
I think she's a kai and her pan is down because she did not get any customer that morning. That's, that's, that's a very good question. A very good one. Now, but you see, when you continue further, when you continue further, you have an idea of why the woman had her head bent down. Five Is that okay? What will five continue? Minutes. We get to know why the woman had her head bent down. And we get to know it was because of what went, she went through in the... Where's my earring? Is yeah. that okay? Your money too. Are you with me? Yes. Good. Now, let me also make you understand that, you know, in literature, in literature, uh, we we say that we don't really have uh, how do you, how do you call it a definite answer to some of these things because this is somebody's you know writing. Now that is not to say that what you are saying is wrong or what you are saying is right. I agree with you to some extent, but when you continue, we get to have an idea about the reason why the woman had her head bent. Now, it could also be the woman is a kaya. No two ways about that. It could also be that is why her head is bent, racks all around the upside down pan, picking her nose, shuffling her feet, oblivious to the bustles and the cause of the driver's mate. Yes, yeah, so to some extent, yes, of course, I'll agree with you that the woman could be a kaya. And that is why maybe she doesn't have anything doing at that moment. And so she was actually thinking about what she's been through in the house that morning you know the argument or the quarrel she had with the husband and so she's lost in her thought and so that is why so yes of course i'll agree with you as well on that there's no way i can say no i'll agree with you there's literature for you are you with me yes do you understand my point yes sir good so yes, I can. I, like I said, I agree with you. Not that I can. I agree with you that yes, the woman possibly could also be a kaya, and so her pan is there. But also, we could have a you know an idea of a home where there's nothing to cook, there's nothing to prepare. We could also have an idea, you know, where the 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 pans or whatever it is, the cooking utensils or whatever it is, are all turned upside down. You know, it could also mean that. It could also mean. You know, it's a kaya year. But I see your your the advantage you have in call literature is that you don't really write essays. All you do is for you to understand and pick the right answers. Paula, I think I see your hand up. Okay, time to close. Shelga. Shelga. Shelga, your hand is up. Yes. Ask your question. Symbolism. Symbolism, yes. Where can we find symbolism? Faded eight year cloth. Line 20, faded eight year cloth. Faded eight year cloth. Yes. What does it symbolize? The cloth. What does it symbolize? Faded eight year cloth. What does it symbolize? What does it symbolize? Do you understand the point I'm asking? The question I'm asking. What does it symbolize? Faded eight-year cloth. What does it symbolize? The cloth. How the cloth is. Okay. Uh, I will say it symbolizes poverty. I am. <laughs> It symbolizes poverty. Faded eight year cloth, you know, it depicts something or symbolizes something. It's just not the faded cloth, but there's something beyond, you know, it, it symbolizes poverty. Okay. Yes. Any question on that particular one, the faded eight year cloth? Any question on that? Faded eight year cloth. No, say. Yes. 
Michael. So the faded eight year clothing. Mm. Uh, second, it symbolizes um, what's the name? Uh, imagery. Now, um, it doesn't symbolize imagery. Imagery, if you want to look at the meaning of what imagery is, imagery, you know, uh, using words to paint a picture. Many times, mental picture, using words to paint a picture. Now, symbolize, when we talk about symbolism. Now, so we are looking at faded ATL cloth. Uh, if I'm, this one, it looks like I, I may be forced to go too deep, deep into literature. But for the question you are asking, faded, when you see somebody in a faded cloth, what is the first thing that comes into your mind? Or you see somebody in a tattered cloth. Now, so we use the word tattered cloth. Now, when we use the word tattered cloth, in your mind, all the imagery it gives you is that the thing is torn. But then, if you look at it, it symbolizes something. It could symbolize poverty. It symbolizes poverty in that because the person doesn't have. Person doesn't have. Yeah, so the person continues to wear something which is, you know, which is tattered, which is torn. So the faded ATL cloth is because the young girl doesn't have. So she continues using the same thing over and over and over again. And so it is now faded. You understand? If you have many cloths, we have over 10, 20 cloths, you'll be using different, different ones. So it is difficult for the cloth to begin to fit just like that. But if you continue using the same thing over and over and over and over again, what happens? It fades out. And why do you use it over and over again? You use it over and over again because of poverty, because you don't have any. So it faded ATL cloth. We can say that it is what? It's a symbol, symbolism. It symbolizes poverty. Please, do you understand what I'm saying? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very yes, understand. Okay. Very understand. Michael, your hand is up. Michael, I think your hand is up. Yes, say, please, can we see the next page? Say again. Then the next page. The next page. Okay. Mm. So this is the next. Okay. This is the next page. And so this is it. Now, quickly, for the sake of time, let me just quickly go. This is the commentary. We've done this earlier. And um, so we have some trial questions. We'll go through the questions and then. We'll, we'll, we'll look for the answers. Now, can one of you read the question for us? Any of you can just read a question for us. But we'll look for the answers. Question one. Okay, hold on. Please hold on. Before the question, do we understand the poem? Yes. 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 Please, if you don't understand yes, yes. something, just raise up your hand. If you don't understand something, raise up your hand and let's quickly go over it. Yes, sir. We all understand. understand. Okay, beauty, your hand is up. Unmute yourself and ask. Sir. Yes. Sir, I have a problem with my connection and when i came back you guys were on the uh, literary devices so i don't get what you guys were talking about okay uh beauty what we'll do is let's finish up with the questions then i'll come back to the commentary i'll just quickly go over the commentary again before we close would that be okay yes okay thank you you're welcome all right so the questions yes please read for us continue question one what is the poem 
Makola about. Good. What is the poem Makola about? Um, if you have an answer, just raise up your hand. Yes, Sabaita. Sir, I think it's E. What is E? Can you read for us? <laughs> yes. Both okay. men and women are both men and women are trying to make a living in difficult circumstances. Good. So the poem Makola is about how both men and women are trying to make a living in difficult circumstances. In difficult circumstances. You look at the cat or the, the cat uh, pusher, you look at the mate, you look at the woman in the um, in the first part of the poem, you look at the young girl um, with a baby at the back. So you see that they are all struggling to make a living in their difficult circumstances. So that is correct. Two, please read. Why is the woman oblivious to the noise around her? Okay. Yes, what is the correct answer? We know we read, just raise up your hand. Apenyo, you raise up your hand. Yes, B. She is engrossed in her own thoughts. Good. She is engrossed in her own thoughts. And because of that, she is engrossed in her own thoughts. And because of that, she is oblivious of the noise around her. Question three. Question three. Question three. What, what is the attitude of any to the man in the poem? What is the attitude of any to the man in the poem? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Shoga. Please, I think. Okay, go on, go on. Please go on. Go on. A. She thinks they are bossy. She thinks they are, they are bossy. bossy. Correct. Bossy. Correct. Do we all agree? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Question four. Yes, Question four. Maybe somebody else can read for us. What? Question four. Let somebody else read. Bokulinda, I see your hand up. Bokulinda, I see your hand up. You want to read for us? Okay, Sabaita, please read for us. Question four, Sabaita. What is the significance of the faith? Say a question four. Yes, question four. What is, what is the significance of the faded ATL cloth used by the mother to carry the baby? Good. What is the significance? Yes, question four. Yes, what is the correct answer? It symbolizes economic hardship. Good. It also means that poverty. So you see what we were saying earlier. The faded ATL cloth yes. symbolizes economic hardship. Also, we could also use the word poverty. Yes. Is that well understood? Yes. Yes, Good. sir. Good. Question five. Question five. The word whimper, the word whimper in the poem is an example of. It's an example of. 
Yes, number five. It's an example of any hand up. Michael, I think your hand is up. Say. Yes. Say C. Matopoya. All right, so it's the word wimpa in the poem in a, is an example of onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia. Yes, number six. What does the pan tent upside down signify? Mm-hmm. Yes. What does the pan tend upside down signify? Yes. Who would want to answer that question? Yes. A D. It's what? The woman is getting ready. So the woman is getting ready to, to leave. Number six. S yes. C. C. Say, see, there'll be no cooking. Okay, somebody is saying the woman is getting ready to leave. Somebody is saying there will, there will be no cooking, yes? So now we are having two answers. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Shelga. Say, see. You go with what? See. See, there will be no see. cooking. Will... Yes. Okay, the, somebody said the woman is getting ready to leave. William, your hand is up. Yes, said the woman is getting ready to leave. <laughs> All right, I'll go with C. There'll be no cooking. Number six, I'll go with C. Oh. If you say the woman is getting ready to leave, oh. what, are, what, what shows she's getting ready to leave? The woman is sitting down there uh, with a pan turned upside down, lost in her thoughts. It doesn't give any clue at all that she's getting ready to leave. You understand? It doesn't give us any clue at all that she's getting ready to leave. Do you want to explain your answer? Why you think that okay, a woman is getting say, ready what? to leave? Okay, go on. Okay, then say, why is the answer there will be no say again so why is that the answer is there will be no cooking there will be no cooking because there is nothing to cook because of poverty so usually you know there are some homes um, when they are done when they wash uh, the the cooking utensils or the pans or whatever it is they turn them upside down they are not cooking so they turn them upside down aha uh -huh. it doesn't it doesn't mean that she's if she's, um, you say that the woman is getting ready to leave, leave to where and from where? Is there any clue at all as to why the woman is getting ready to leave and to where? But we have an idea that the pan turned upside down is because there is nothing to cook. There is nothing to cook. There is nothing to cook. What the? Do you understand? Yeah, the noise is too much. I have to I have to mute all of you. So yes, uh, Afanya, I think you wanted to ask a question. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, yes, Afanya, said, yes. She said there is nothing to cook in. Then why did she go? Why did she go to the market? Why did she go home? Now, let me get your question clearly, Michael. No, sir. I mean, why did she go? So you said uh, there's nothing. Okay. So you said there's nothing to cook. So why then did she go to the market? Why then did she go to the market? 
now now if if i understand your question clearly why then did she go to the market if she actually went to the market perhaps to work now and like i said earlier that the use of the word makola does not necessarily mean that uh you know they are all in the market buying and selling. It does not necessarily mean that. The use of the word makola is just, you know, a vehicle or a tool to convey, you know, the, the, you know, the standard or the economic um, um, hardship of situation or conditions of these kinds of people that have been, you know, um, talked about in the point. And somebody asked, could it not be that a woman is a Kayaye? And I said earlier that, yes, it is possible. It is possible that she's a Kayaye. It is also possible. Now, but the question is, if the woman is a Kayaye and she wants to go home, is there any clue in the poem to show that she's a Kayaye? And he said the woman is getting ready to leave. To leave to where? But my understanding is this. My understanding is this, that in the poem, we get to know that it's because there is nothing to cook. So all the pans and all the things have been turned upside down because there is nothing to cook. That is my understanding. So the, the question says, what does the pan turn upside down signify? It signifies that there will be no cooking. Why? Because there is nothing to cook. But if you say it's because I, the woman is getting ready to leave, getting ready to leave to where? That is what I don't understand. If you, can, if you can prove to me that a woman has a place to go to or based on whatever is, it is that is going on, then yes, we can look at that. But for me, if you ask me with my understanding of the poem and the analysis right. we've given so far, it means that there will be nothing to cook because there is nothing to cook. There is no food. So the pans have been turned upside down. Sir. Yes. Sir, please, sir. Okay. To my understanding, hmm. the woman she went to the market to work. Okay. And now that she's not getting any job or she's not doing anything, she has turned the pan upside down mm -hmm. and she's ready to go home. Also, we don't cook in a pan. We mm -hmm. cook in a pot. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So say that's a, so that's my understanding. So me, I think the answer is D. The woman is getting ready to leave. Now, okay. Now, so I, I understand your point. And, and you, 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 you said something which is, which is very, very interesting. That we don't cook in the pan, we cook in the pot. Very well understood. And I agree with you perfectly. But you see, the question is, does that mean that once the pan is turned upside down, it means the woman is ready to leave? So maybe she's not getting... Okay. Now the pan turned upside down. So maybe she's not getting anywhere to do, and that she's tired. Okay. Okay. So the pan being turned upside down could also mean that she's tired and she wants to rest. How about that? Yes. Uh huh. How about that? Say so it can be. <laughs> yes. Now the woman is in the market. Okay. They're saying that there will be no cooking. Sir. Okay. Uh, Willa, let me come to you. I think somebody's asking a question. Is it beauty or who? Uh, sir. Yes, beauty. So what I think sir. is that, you mm. see, at the, at the starting of the poem, they said head bent, rags all around. I think that a woman went to the market and because she didn't get sir. any work, that, I agree with William. Uh, uh -huh. Agree with me, though. <laughs> Sir, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah, I agree with William. Okay, so what we are going to do is this. Let's, let's, let's. Say, 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 yes. and I'm saying, say. Yes. Say. Yes, I'm listening. Yes, I'm listening. Please talk. Sir, please, I also agree with Williams because, mm -hmm. sir, me, I also agree with 
I'm, I said I agree with William said because she's a Kayo. So maybe they are referring to the Kayo bow. Now, I'm, I'm, okay, fine. Like I said, now I, I, will not, I will not disagree with you. But my point is, does, does it mean that once the pan has been turned upside down, it means that the woman is getting ready to leave? It could mean many things. That once the pan is turned upside down, it could also mean that the woman is trying to rest. Because yeah. it could also... Could, okay, could it also mean that the woman is trying to rest? Mm -hmm. Yes. It could Say mean yes. that. Mm. Yes. <laughs> okay. Fine. That's okay. Now, so for question six, question six, what we'll do is this. Let's let's um, go back and read on that. That is not to say that the answer William has provided is wrong. I understand his argument and I agree with his argument. Okay, so let's put asterisk on question six. We can still look at that when we come again. Would that be okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good, good. Yes. Good. Let's go on to the next question. Question seven. Let's quickly finish up. It's almost time or it's past time. All right. Somebody can read that for us. Question seven. Who was reading? Who was reading? Sawaita, read. Quote one piece of evidence to support that claim that the girl is not ready to be a mother. All right. So it's a quote one piece of evidence. Yes. Question seven. Oh, but quote one. Yeah, the maid quote one. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Quote one. So just quote one piece of evidence. Yes. Uh, whose hand is up? Whose hand is up? Whose hand is up? William, I see your hand up again. William. Sir, D. Yes. D. She is too small and sickly. Good. She is too small and too sickly. Obviously, it is evidence to support the fact that. Hey, all right. Let's go on. The girl is not ready to be a mother. It's it's it's. What evidence? Yes, go on. Yes. What evidence? What evidence is there in the poem that the women are not different from the men? Yes. A. Question A. A. A, all, of all of them are suffering. Are suffering. Good. 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 Question nine. nine ten. The posture of the woman sitting with her head bent suggests. The question nine. Is thinking hard. Question nine, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm mean, she's thinking hard. Question nine. <laughs> yeah, she's thinking hard. The poster of the woman sitting with her head bent down suggests hey, she's ready to I'm fight. A judge, 100%. She's thinking hard. See, she hard. has given up. D, she is solving a problem. He is worried about the children. Yes. Now look at these two answers. B, she is taking hard. And C, she has given up. She has given up. She has given up. Now, William, William, William. Why is William? William. William, are you with me? Yes, sir. Now, what answer would you provide for question nine? I want you to provide your answer because I'll refer you to something. Question, look at question nine. Sir, she is thinking hard. She is thinking hard. Don't forget, yes. earlier you said that, question six, you said that a woman is ready to, to what? Get ready to leave, right? Yes. If you think she's getting ready, you think he's she's getting ready to leave. It means that question nine, she has she's not just thinking her. It means she has given up. That is why she's ready to leave. 
Mm. Have you thought about that? Yes, sir. <laughs> say he's lying. <laughs> oh, he's lying. Mm, he didn't think he's about that one. Yes, his answer <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> oh, okay. So, what is your answer? <laughs> Okay, what is your uh, the postal say, sitting with her head bent suggests that word say she's thinking hard, hard. she's thinking hard say, um, because yeah. like in question six there's no food so she's thinking hard yeah hard. you see yeah. so you see that question six will determine the answer you give in question nine Yes. yes. So William is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's leave it at that. Let's go to let's go to question ten. Let's leave that. Work on that. Question ten. Yes, read and let's finish it up. Let's finish it up quickly. Which of the following is a good lesson taught by the poem? Yes. Question ten. Yes. Um. Say. There are no easy solutions to life's <laughs> problems. Problem. Good. Yes. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time for today. Um, next week, Monday. We'll be doing something else. I'm here to decide on what we'll be doing. But next week, Wednesday, we'll be doing call literature again. So on Wednesdays, we'll be doing call literature, like I said earlier. But on um, Mondays, we'll do something else. So that it wouldn't be like every day, we, every time we meet, we are doing the same thing, the same thing. Monday, we'll do something else. But Wednesdays are um, dedicated for call literature. So go back and read your point. Let me see. Okay, let me just um, give you what we'll do next week. Next, we'll go look at um, this poem. Um, what is the poem? Lost Friends. Lost Friends. So start reading on Lost Friends. Lost Friends by Larry Peters. Thank you very much, ladies.